Bé, doncs jo faré de... La meva funció és de fer de moderador d'aquesta sessió. I el que... Bé, i ells el que faran és bàsicament presentar durant 20 minuts unes... les seves idees al voltant d'uns eixos que hem treballat plegats i del que el que volem és, en tot cas, després de les presentacions, generar un debat entre ells i amb vosaltres sobre moltes coses que s'han tractat també en l'anterior sessió. En l'anterior sessió han sorgit molts temes que que realment donava molt de sí, ens hem quedat curts, com sempre, i això és bo perquè, en tot cas, el que ens permet és ser conscients de la quantitat de preguntes i de reflexions que ens aporten aquest tipus de col·laboracions entre la ciència, l'art i, en general, la cultura, la ciència i la societat. El que volem amb aquesta sessió és intentar mostrar exemples de projectes, de dinàmiques, de processos, d'estructures, d'idees que treballen al voltant d'aquesta relació entre la ciència i les arts. I el que volem és posar en relació els projectes en concret que han estat a la primera sessió amb les diferents visions de les tres persones que ens acompanyen avui, que és un honor i és un plaer tenir-les aquí amb nosaltres. És un luxe i esperem poder aprofitar-les amb el temps de què disposem i, en tot cas, després intentar generar un debat. Agrair, sobretot, el fet de l'Ajuntament que posi a disposició de la ciutadania un projecte tan interessant com la Bienal de la Ciència i, alhora, també, el CCDB per acollir-nos en aquest marc. I, en tot cas, solament desitjar-vos que gaudiu de les seves presentacions i anem pensant les preguntes per després. I vull just tell them about what we are going to do right now. We have 20 minutes for each one of you. And what we will do is just after your presentation, we will open the discussion between all of you and with the colleagues. And I was just and the, and the, 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 the audience, and I was just uh, telling them about the fact that we, are, uh, we want to connect the, the, previous uh, the previous ideas that were you know, taken into account in the previous uh, presentations, and uh, later on we will try to connect with all, all of them. I know you, some of you were not able to follow because it was in Spanish, but, but I think I will try to, <laughs> to connect them, and they are there, so they will be able to talk with you in this sense. So, mm, please, uh, many thanks for being here, and uh, Guna, please, it's your turn. Thank you, Pao, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so, I think that when I, go there, I want to start my, my presentation, yes, which is going to be about self-experimentation in yes. science and art, uh, by, by contextualizing this, this Biennale, right? Uh, the idea of art and science being separate realms, uh, separate in terms of discipline, separate in terms of methodologies, and that they should they, they rarely meet or they are, they are so different from each other that it's really difficult to bring them together. It's a very commonly held idea. And I, and I think that both what you will see from the other present, presenters, but also what you heard in the previous session, uh, basically indicates that, that there, is, there is value in getting artists and scientists to work together. The collaboration is an important one. And what makes the collaboration possible is the fact that they both share similar uh, attitudes and similar methodologies, even though they seem very different, and they seem to be, uh, in terms of perspective, approaching those problems from different uh, sets of assumptions and ideas. Uh, what I wanted to do in my talk is to focus specifically on the idea of experimentation. You know, the experiment is something that is very specific to science. You know, when 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 a scientist says. I am doing an experiment. Most of us understand what that means. Um, when an artist says that I am working experimentally, we also understand what that means. Um, and what I wanted to do in my talk is to actually talk about a specific kind of experimentation uh, in the history of art and science and try and help uh, us tease out some of the interesting elements that, that is common to both art and science. 
that you will find that artists and scientists, even though they look very different, talk very different, they seem to be very different in methodologies, they fundamentally have the same level of curiosity, they approach the world and reality with the same kind of, of passion. And uh, I hope the, the presentation would help uh, facilitate that. Experimentation, self-experimentation in science and art. What is experiment? Um, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time with that. You know, the, 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 when people think about the sciences, uh, uh, they start basically, if you look at the history of science, science was based on the idea that there are some observable phenomena in the world that can be observed, and by observation, you can make some deductions about it. You can make some inductive uh, judgments about it. And these were the classic methods for science for a very, very long time. The experimental method is a relatively recent invention in, in, in the sciences. And it's a, it's a relatively recent invention which is fundamentally different from the way uh, the history of science evolved. Um, so if you look at uh, classical observation-based science, it's based on this belief that the world out there has some truths, some, some, some facts, some laws that you can deduce from observing it. But at some point, scientists understood that the world and reality was far more stubborn. It had to be poked, as Martha said, uh, she used the word poking. You have to poke it and poke it in a particular way that allows you to find something that you would otherwise not be able to just simply observe. So the experiment is a very uh, 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 important and a significant development in the history of science. Uh, but it also is a departure from classic science, observation-based science, in a way that is indicating that art scientists were not just uh, um, uh, feeling that it was enough just to watch the world and make deductions about it and make inductions about it, but to actually uh, make uh, something act on the world in such a way that the world and reality would present some other findings. And so I, I'm, I'm suggesting that we think about experiment as a very creative turn in the history of science. And what I also am, uh, am urging you to think about is Art is fundamentally about that, that acting on the world, changing it. Uh, and I would really uh, encourage people to think about uh, many of these issues in terms of uh, what Hugo Dingler, uh, who did some really good work around this, he talks about it as you know, experiments, as ways, as a method of acting on the world in a way that will allow certain things to be opened up. So what does... What does uh, so based on this ideas of experiment as creative, as a kind of creative poke into the world and reality to get particular kinds of answers, um, I wanted to next focus specifically on self-experimentation. Now, what is self-experimentation? Self-experimentation is when you say, look, I, I have these ideas and I want to uh, experiment uh, whether it works or not on myself, right? Uh, in the sciences, it is seen as a taboo subject. Most scientists, if you tell them, oh, uh, you have a cure for, uh, for cancer, oh, why don't you use it on yourself and show that this is, well, most of them would say, well, I could, I could do it, but I would not share those results because it does not feel like it's objective enough because science has been, has been, uh, has been forced to think about itself as the objective, uh, as be based on objective standards. So self-experimentation has been frowned upon in science, though there is a long history of self-experimentation in the sciences, and I'll try and show you some of that. So of course, the, 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 the classic example uh, in, in fiction is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Uh, Adel Stevenson's uh, book that basically talks about an, a scientist who experimented with what it, what it, what it is to uh, explore the dark side. Uh, this is uh, Sanctorius Sanctorius uh, from the 17th century. Um, Sanctorius Sanctorius spent 30 years uh, every day, every day of the, uh, for those 30 years, he measured everything he ate and drank, 
and he also measured everything he passed uh, uh, and shit as, and, and as urine at the end of every day. So every time, he, he did this every day for religiously for 30 years. And that was the, and he used it, used this weighing chair. What you see there is him using the, the oh, where's the, well, that's him, or oh, that's, that's him using the chair, this, uh, this weighing chair, he was weighing himself, and he was looking at the difference between what he had and what he passed. And he was using that to understand the, the, what is today understood as dietetics, the, 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 the science of dietetics, the, the understanding of how our metabolic system works and what becomes transferred to, into energy. Uh, Humphrey Davy, an important uh, development that he was involved in is laughing gas, uh, nitrous oxide. So, uh, and a lot of times he was experimenting on himself, but he also had parties where he was getting people uh, high on, on uh, nitrous oxide because it was an important way of just, because people were coming into these parties and actually really getting and laughing and, and, and getting really happy. Uh, this is uh, Nikolai uh, Minovici. Uh, he was interested in the forensics of hanging. He wanted to understand how a person, when and how a person dies, and in order to, un from hanging. So he actually literally hang himself multiple times, and each time to understand what the threshold is at the point at which he dies, or he could die. Uh, this is Stubbins Firth, a very, very interesting figure in the history of experimentation. He was very interested in studying um, uh, yellow fever and how it, uh, how it happened. And what he did was, um, uh, he was trying to understand and identify the causes. He did not believe that yellow fever was contagious. So he was trying to prove that it is not contagious by constantly eating uh, and drinking the vomit of people who, uh, uh, who had yellow fever. Uh, and his argument was that, look, you know, I'm, I'm taking it and I'm not getting sick, so there must be, it must not be contagious. Uh, this is Barry Marshall, who actually won the Nobel Prize by uh, identifying the Helobacteria uh, 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 pylori, pylori uh, which, was, uh, which was a major development in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a cure or in treatment of, of gastritis. Uh, and he experimented on himself, and he got the Nobel Prize for it in 2005. Now, if you, just in case you think that this is just a weird phenomenon in the sciences, this was a study done by uh, Alan Weiss. Uh, he surveyed 465 instances of self-experimentation between 1800 and 1999. The highest number was in, uh, uh, in infectious diseases. You can see a lot of self-experimentation, anesthesia, physiology, pharma pharmacology, radiology, and oncology. So uh, it, it's a, it is not a rare phenomenon. It is something that scientists are very engaged in. Uh, this, is, uh, an uh, this is a list of all those people who won the Nobel Prize based on self-experimentation as a part of their study. So again, it is, it is not... Uh, 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 what they call uh, a site phenomena in the sciences. I want to sh now spend a bit of time talking about self-experimentation in the arts. Stellark is an, a very important example of experiments on himself, where he, he was using, so he had an idea of the obsolete body. He understood that the body, uh, as it is, because it's modular, uh, would, uh, the body as it is would not be, would not be sufficient for the long-term evolution, uh, evolutionary purposes, and he was interested in integrating himself with, with robotics. And he experimented with robotics as well as with, uh, with uh, tissue culture technology. This is Orlan, who systematically transformed a face in relation to uh, exploring the idea of identity and how it is, it is, uh, it is determined by um, uh, by, by, by differences in how you constitute yourself. Uh, this is Eduardo Katz, who, who implanted uh, uh, a chip in his, uh, a microchip in his, uh, in his leg in order to uh, talk about the idea of, of surveillance and information and identifying information. And, and on, the, 
sorry. Um, so uh, on on the right, you see uh, him uh, experimenting with uh, uh, um, adu uh, adutunia, which is actually a plant, uh, a flower that expressed his uh, his blood. Uh, this is uh, Moon Ribas, who actually implanted um, uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic, ma magnetic uh, nodes in her, her body in order to sense seismic uh, uh, events. Uh, this is Marion Laval Jontet, who is part of the art, Artist Collective Art Orient Object, uh, who did um, a performance where she, uh, um, she was interested in the relationship between animals and humans and exploring and blurring that, 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 that distinction. And so she, uh, she had a blood transfusion of, uh, of horses' blood into herself, and she also started, had installed these, um, uh, these prosthetic hoofs on herself. Uh, and that's, um, that's her working with, uh, with, with, uh, with a cat. Uh, this is Thomas Twaits, who was interested in exploring uh, he's also called the goat man. He basically transformed, uh, he used prosthetics and, and, and tried to live with the goats for a, for, a, for a period of time. He also experimented with just eating grass and, and finding it very hard that it, it was very difficult to digest grass. Uh, this is our, our good friend, Madame de Menezes, uh, who, uh, who worked with uh, her partner, uh, who is a uh, who is uh, a uh, biological researcher uh, working specifically on immunology? And Marta and Luis were interested in exploring the ideas of immortality and how uh, transplantation uh, uh, between two individuals who are in love with each other, who are married to each other, and how those tensions. And I, I know Marta is going to talk about it, so I won't spend too much time on it. But it's it's uh, it's there is a long history of experimentation in 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 art self experimentation in art and science and it's important before i end i just wanted to say that it's it's important to understand that what we experience as fundamentally different right uh, and what we are taught in schools you know when when you when you uh, uh, when you're in school you are taught these sep these subjects as separate things Art and science are two different things. You, you, you approach them differently. But fundamentally, both of them are driven by a kind of immense, passionate curiosity about the world. And self-experimentation -experiment is uh, a very interesting example where that passion gets, gets uh, channeled into, in, in ways that really uh, uh, play out what, uh, what Artists and what is common to both artists and scientists, um, and you know um, a lot of what we will talk about in our panel and what we 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 feel passionate about is that these these two kinds of individuals and with people with very different attitudes towards the way uh, to approach reality, they would benefit from connecting to each other. They would benefit from collaboration because. Even though they, uh, they have the same levels of passion, they bring very different toolkits to the table. They bring very different sets of ideas and perspectives and methodologies that are, are, are immensely helpful to understanding the world. And it's, it's important for us to continue to try and create opportunities for the next generation of, of, of young people who are interested in art and science to find ways to, to connect uh, and, and not keep them separate. And I, and I think that one of our big challenges is that universities are built on that, art institutions and science institutions are built on this, keeping themselves separate. And I, I applaud the, the organization for developing a festival like this, which brings these perspectives together, brings these people together. And I understand that in the audience, a lot of you are some of you are from the arts, some of you are from the sciences, and some of you are interested in art and science. Uh, how many of you are from the arts? How many of you are from the sciences? Good. A majority, that's great, fantastic. Welcome to the club. Uh, 
you are today converted. You, you, shall, you shall cross fertilize your ideas. So thank you very much, guys, and uh, good luck. Thanks, Guna, for your nice psych talk. I know it's time for Marta if you want to. <laughs> good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for um, bringing me over and, um, and uh, welcoming us. It's uh, obviously a, a theme that I'm interested in, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here and be able to discuss with you uh, what we're doing. Please time me, uh, Paul. Uh, so um, I, am, I am an artist, as, uh, as, as you have heard before, and I'm here to talk about, so this is a deba debate on art and science. As an artist who has been working in laboratories for a very long time, almost 20 years, um, um, it's, it's, there are lots of things that I agree with, there's lots of things that I don't agree with, the, with what's been said today uh, uh, or in other places that talk about art and science. I don't have to agree with, uh, with, any, uh, with everything and, uh, and I think a debate is a really good um, idea. Um, uh, so, I, I, maybe a little bit like Guna, um, I, think, I think methodology is a good way to start when we talk about art and science and I put a, a scheme that is obviously not mine. Uh, it's not about art or science, it's about design. Uh, but I think it's very um, illustrative of, of, uh, of, of methodologies and, and how maybe they're, um, they're not that different from field to field. And you may disagree with me on this and, may, and tell me. Um, but um, um, there's something about this diagram that I really, really like, which is the beginning of it, which is empathize. And this is why I put it there. Uh, there's very little that I do fortunately, and maybe I am very fortunate for that, but there's very little that I dedicate a lot of time and, and, and energy to that I don't empathize with. So all of the works that I do in my profession, and, and maybe not only in my profession, um, is to dedicate to research uh, about things that I'm passionate about. And this is not strange for, um, uh, uh, for it's not different in art and science. Um, or in some other fields of knowledge uh, production that I know. So you need to define your pro problem. You need to uh, think of how, to, how do you poke at it. Um, um, you need to then do research and, and understand what other knowledge is, exists about what you're trying to do, what you're trying to research on, and this is what I do. And then you come up with experiments. You come up with experiments that will not only uh, uh, try out your hypothesis, you know, you suspect something is the way it is and you try to find out if this is true or not. Or maybe not if it's true or not, but if it works, if it makes sense, if it is relevant for your field of knowledge. And, 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 and then you make up, actually, as an artist, you make up a piece, you make up uh, a project, you actually, uh, more often than not, build something that will enable others to experience what you went through in some way. And this you test by exhibitions, by talking to people, by many different uh, ways. As an artist, my interest has been always with an underlying theme. It's identity. Identity is uh, what drives my curiosity in general. Every piece of knowledge that I find that will make me re-question what I think about identity is something that I feel passionate about and that I will unavoidably research on eventually because a lot of things make me question what I think about identity and I don't have time to do everything at the same time. And this has led me to um, jump through different areas of knowledge and different laboratories uh, uh, in consequence. So. Um, I did butterflies in an evolutionary biology lab. I did tissue culture. I did uh, um, microbiology. I did proteomics. Um, I did, um, again, microbiology in a different way. Oh, where is it? Where are you? There. Uh, um, cell biology, functional magnetic resonance, um, um, uh, cancer research, and, and, and um, and software uh, uh, blast uh, analysis, 
sometimes I take exactly the same technology, which is CRISPR in this case, and I do di very different projects depending on what I'm asking. So the same technology does, so technology itself doesn't make the project. The, the issue and sometimes the material completely changes uh, the, the aspect of, of the project itself. And here specifically, because um, I wanted to um, maybe uh, continue on the idea uh, that Guna brought to, um, to, the, to the table, uh, this idea of experimentation, the idea of working with a scientist side by, by side, um, I wanted to maybe give you an example of a little bit of extreme. So for the first time, I've, I've, I've been married more or less the same number of years as, that I've been working in laboratories, but actually it was in 2014, the first time that I worked with my husband, who's a scientist. Uh, and, and, um, and I'm glad we didn't just work together because we are close at hand. Um, uh, we actually decided to work together because we were interested in the same ideas um, suddenly and, and, and working and living with an immunologist makes you really think about identity in many ways and self and non-self is a constant um, um, uh, um, phrase uh, or part of a phrase that happens um, in our house um, and the first project that we did together was Immortality for Two. In this project, um, it, it was an, uh, the idea was about exploring what does it mean to be immortal. It's a it's a wish, it's a desire, it's an ambition, not just for artists or for scientists. It's something that we seem to be obsessed with um, in many different ways. And what does it mean? And and learning that, um, for instance, in a very biological uh, sense, uh, immortality can be just uh, a cancerous cell. Uh, was something that made me think, okay, there's a difference here in understanding and the use of language and, 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 uh, and, and, um, and meaning. So what is it about immortality? What is it? And how, uh, uh, how are we uh, thinking about achieving it? Um, so Immortality for Two uh, started out as a project on immortality for me. Uh, and it ended up as immortality for us for very, very practical reasons, which is something that happens on occasion in projects. So what happened was I am not allowed to work on my own cells outside of my body, not for ethical reasons in particular, but in this case it was a health and safety issue. So there's a, a, a higher risk risk of getting cancer if you're making your own cells cancerous outside of your body, which makes sense. Uh, and so this is not a risk that any uh, uh, institution will allow any researcher to, to take. So by trying to come up with the idea that I could make myself immo immortal outside of my own body by creating a line of cells out of my own cells that were immortal cell lines, that were cancerous cell lines, uh, I couldn't do it to myself. And this was interesting because it posed a problem to the piece itself. Would it alter the, the concept of the piece or not? And uh, thinking about it, I thought, okay, who wants to be immortal in any possible way alone? So wouldn't it make more sense to actually create a piece that is immortality for two and do it with someone that you would consider living an immortal life with. And so I asked my husband to join me in this project, and he did. And this, this way, it was legal, it was possible, it was fine, because I made Luis's cells immortal, and he made my cells immortal. And of course, it was so, sort of romantic, and, and, um, and um, I'm not a romantic person, so this is very uncomfortable. Um, um, and, and so it was, it was really interesting to think that, yes, we're doing this together and we're doing it in parallel. And it's very romantic that we're doing a project together. But, of course, he's, he's an immunologist. He decided that these cells needed to be immune system cells. And immune system cells exist to reject others. <laughs> so the, these cells could never share the same space together. So... After all of the protocol, after making this, these cells cannot 
coexist in the same space. And the only way that they are in the same space is over the two uh, overlapping projections of the cells growing on top of the table. So you see the cell flasks growing on two opposite sides of this big table. And uh, under the cell flasks, you have two microscopes that are continuously uh, streaming images to the two projectors over the table. And in the overlap of those two images of the cells growing, this is the only place where we are together immortal. The second project that came after this came about because we listened to this gentleman over here that passed away in uh, July 2017 uh, present his work, uh, his life work. He was a very, very influential uh, researcher and immunologist. Uh, and he, his research is the reason why we have transplantation to today. As uh, my husband, Luis, as I told you, is an immunologist. He started his career in Oxford University researching on transplantation. Uh, so it was a very, very interesting aspect for him. After this talk, it was really interesting for us because we thought, okay, the experiments that they did that were so important for today's uh, medicine, uh, wouldn't it be interesting to, to go through that process. What would be fun would be if we could um, reject each other literally. Um, so we took up this, this uh, research and this uh, very well-known um, experiments that were done in the 60s um, uh, that included experimentation in colleagues in the lab. So the whole set of experiments that gave rise to clinical transplantation today were done in um, members of the lab initially, then members of the department, and eventually uh, other, other people around. So there's a club in the world where if you have a scar like this, they will go and say, ooh, but you have to go to an immunology um, conference for people to come to you and say, oh, you did one of those too. It's sort of interesting. So uh, what we proposed ourselves to do was to um, reject each other. Uh, and what does this mean? For me as an artist, for me as an artist working in, in terms of identity, this is the ultimate definition of identity. The immune system exists to define you against what is other. The self and non-self is fundamental for our understanding of how the immune system works. In this case, um, I wanted to, more importantly, def to um, affirm my identi identity to the rejection of Luis and wanted him to do the same. Uh, why is it important to me? We've been together for 20 years. I need to remind myself that I am myself and not just us periodically, and so it was really important for me to you know, state in a very literal way that you are not me, and I am not you. And though we were together and we were fine, we're not the same person. Uh, so, but if you talk to Luis, it's a very, very different story, which is very interesting in itself. I'll try to explain to you a little bit. But the, the, as you see there, so for instance, for Luis, he will tell you this is a life pact which is a very interesting idea for me. So actually, the production of antibodies means that in my body, I will always have some a molecule that will forever recognize Luis, and Luis will have the same to me. So actually, a process that lasts about a month, which is the rejection of the skin of, of the other, which was here, and there's nothing of Luis left there, left a mark not only here, but more in depth. I will always have something in me that will recognize Luis, even if my eyes don't see him, even if my ears don't hear him, if I can't touch him. If we come into contact intimately through blood, then, um, then it means that my body will recognize him. So this is a different kind of sense for me. And for him, it is, um, it is, He's more romantic than I am. It's a life commitment in the sense that we can't undo this. It's not something that we can take back. Uh, the piece itself is shown as um, a, a projection um, onto a table of the surgery. The surgery was recorded from the top. 
And so what you see there is people actually experiencing the surgery on their arms. So the surgery is projected onto your arm. You're invited to sit down and put your arm there, and you can follow the whole procedure of the exchange of skin between you and someone that you bring with you or a perfect stranger in, in, in the exhibition space. So we wanted to make sure that people could experience something that happened only once, and it's not going to happen again. So this is, this, is, this, is, this is what I came here to talk about. It's sort of uh, strange as a, a collaboration. Well, I don't know. It may, you tell me if it's strange or not. But it was my objective to think about, you have lots of different types of collaborations. I've worked with many different scientists, as you can see through here, I've been through many different labs, many different scientists, many different fields of knowledge in, in biology. I'm always producing new knowledge, or my objective is always to make new knowledge in the field of art experimentation or act practice, whatever you may want to call it. Um, but I gave you a little bit of a sort of a, a more radical uh, collaboration, which very personal, but at the same time, uh, a good example of how I don't abdicate who I am to work on a project with someone else. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Pau and uh, Irma, for the invitation and the option and uh, opportunity to talk to you uh, today. Um, yeah, about uh, new biomedia art speculating about the current art and science uh, liaison. So there's a long history uh, of uh, art and science collaboration. Um, science was artistic and artists worked with science. But in the 19th century, uh, those two worlds that were, you know, like always put together in a kind of liaison just grew apart. And uh, about 30 years ago, um, artists started again to work with scientists in the field of biotech, um, biotechnology, and this is, well, my uh, field of research, and I would like to show you uh, two examples and a little bit of the history, how this came, you know, uh, um, how this uh, collaboration started, and then I will show you a few more slides. I actually have too many slides, but um, I can skip a few, um, because I think this is very important for the topic of um, art and science, but also art and the city, or say, um, science and the public and the lay public today. So, in the last 30 years, we have seen increase, uh, an increasing number of collaborations between artists and scientists, and the reasons for this are very complex. But one important factor is certainly, that the, is, uh, certainly the fact that technology and science have become fundamental to our modern societies. In just a few decades, the effects uh, of the ongoing technization of our daily life has um, come to a um, um, to be now um, yeah, seen in virtually every single domain of our life. This development um, has had also profound effects on the fine arts. So in the 1980s, artists started to make uh, incursions uh, to dedicate um, and to influence uh, and to uh, infiltrate scientific contexts such as also, as I said in the beginning, the Molecular Biology Lab. At first, these, um, like Marta, and I think Marta is one of the pioneers in this field, in the beginning they were quite isolated, and very often they didn't know each other. Now it's a movement, and uh, uh, there are much more scientific institutions that invite uh, uh, artists, they, they open the gates, and nowadays we have a lot of artists in residence, programs. However, over time, an increasing number of artists began to work with methods and also with practices from these fields, such as genetic engineering, genome editing, or synthetic biology, articulating a very different perspective on what new media art could be and established new ideas of biomedia. 
In those days, uh, artists began exploring the interrelation between the genetic code and the digital scope. DNA, genetics, molecular biology, transgenic, or synthetic DNA. And how information and systems theories inspired uh, geneticists in the 1940s to describe living organisms as, li as uh, technical entities. And I think this is for many artists going into the labs or that are, you know, like um, described as bio-artists, for them it's quite important to see and to describe how biology was turned into technologies uh, in, during the 20th century. So this is a successful application of concepts of information and system theory to biological processes, as well as the efforts of molecular biology to conceive life in terms of message, information, organization, or organism, had far-reaching consequences. One result of this transfer, this transfer of metaphors was the formation of metaphors such as the genetic code and the genetic program, which linked the powerful metaphor of the Book of Life with DNA. Um, yeah, uh, with DNA, um, or the Book of Life, for example. So, in those days, cybernetics came to, or tried in the 1940s, cybernetics tried to come to grips with the growing complexity of the postmodern world. In the other, on the other hand, molecular biology was going into the opposite direction by attempting to avoid complexity as far as possible from its research endeavors through reductionism. While molecular biologists strove to establish a kind of new biology, which was clearly different to the old organism-orientated biology and aimed to liberate their description of, the li of living organisms, from the um, traditional vitalist preoccupation with function, and above all, to expunge the words like purpose, organization, harmony from their vocabulary, um, that uh, carried the tent, all those uh, words that carried the tent of a theological foundation at the same time as physicists and engineers were introducing these terms into cybernetics. So, and, um, then I would like to show uh, uh, talk a little bit about an artist, uh, an American artist, Joe Davis, who became very interested in the 70s and in the 80s because he was looking for a kind of media that would uh, be able to carry information in a very different way from what um, he knew uh, from all kind of silicon-based information media and this was DNA, because there's no other medium in the world, on our pl planet, that is as, um, yeah, I would say, as powerful and as, uh, uh, yeah, as, as the DNA. And so he made a couple of projects uh, with uh, people, from, with scientists from MIT, and he started to manipulate DNA, he started to work with synthetic DNA, but the interesting thing was that he was so much based uh, in the science world that it was very difficult for him to be exhibited in the art world. So now he is regarded as one of the founding fathers of uh, bioart, uh, but in the beginning, it, I think it took at least two decades until he was recognized in the field of art as well. Although the scientists at MIT especially at the MIT Biology Lab, they loved working with him, but not so much the galleries or the white cube. Oops, uh, and um, yeah, and interesting, um, some media theorists like Peter Weibel, they came up with the term bioart and uh, how people and, and scientists uh, thought about art and uh, biotechnology already in the 1980s in a text called Biotechnologie and Kunst. And he also did a huge exhibition um, in 1993. This is very early for this topic. Yes, and um, yeah, DNA um, or working with cells and other like topics like synthetic biology is now, I would say, a common thing in the fine arts. But in those days, it was very particular. 
Uh, yeah, and one of the early artists, also here, Kevin Clark, um, just to give you a glance how difficult it was for the artists to get access to laboratories. This is one of the, fir one of the first pieces in 1988 where an uh, artist became access to a laboratory to sequence part of his DNA. Um, so, and he worked later on, he worked with the blood of other uh, uh, artists, uh, like here, the portrait of John Cage, for example, from 1993. This is very early in the field of bioart. But the thing is, just to make you uh, an understanding, was so incredibly difficult in those days and very, very expensive to sequence DNA. Now, um, like, uh, now it's almost, the costs are almost down to, to nothing, so it's very, very cheap nowadays. But uh, in, uh, in the 1980s, it was very difficult and very expensive. Uh, sequencing machines looked like that in the age, or in the, in the days when Kevin Clark was working on that. Nowadays, and there's a long history, I will not like, like bore you with a long, long history of DNA sequences, but of course it started in 19th century and now we have like tools like this uh, from, uh, from a, a company called Nanopore. It's uh, like a pocket size uh, tool. So this is, um, when you talk about art and science, the science side Art science also changed, but the science side and the tools and technologies and the costs and, the, um, and, and, and getting hands on those tools changed dramatically uh, in the last 30 years. So, and of course we have things like this, like companies like this, 23andMe, where you can uh, get a kind of uh, yeah, insight into your DNA for $99. It's not very precise, but still. And of course, nowadays, you also have companies that help you making a little bit of extra money uh, by sequencing your DNA uh, and giving the uh, companies that are probably interested in your DNA because probably you have a certain disease, for example, help you uh, making some extra money. So this is a very interesting developing in the last couple of years. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting that you read uh, sentences like, a human genome is the blueprint to what makes you and who you are. So, and of course we had a lot of artists also in the 80s, in the 90s, that worked on that with, uh, but here we see gel electrophoresis, which is compared to sequencing, super cheap. So, but artists worked with that, with these, um, visual icons from science, and they became quite successful, like Paul Venus. I have some more slides about Paul Venus because he's really working um, in detail on that. And uh, yeah, this is Paul, but what you see also here, that when I showed you the first slide of Kevin uh, Clark, it was like a picture you could hang on the wall in the white cube. This was still representation, a kind of representation of a language or an artistic language that would still fit it fit in into the into the art world into a uh, um, um, white cube or into a commercial setting. This changed like around 2000 changed a lot. Nowadays, this the artist is like part of a, I wouldn't say performance, but part of a setting and is looking to talk about his work and talk about what he's doing uh, in, in a white cube like this, for example. And it's more or less about uh, communicating in a critical way what science is all about. So, and uh, of course we have a lot of companies that now make money with that, with, uh, like metaphors, like from life comes art, but of course it's not art, it's kitsch. But um, anyway, so, uh, but we also have other artists, like the Austrian artist Sonja Bäumel, who really profoundly works together with scientists about the microbiome and the concept of, se of the self. These are just a few slides I show by Sonja Bäumel. 
But we also have, of course, uh, artists like Lynn Hirschman Leeson working together with Joshua Zainer, who was a NASA scientist who is now a DIY bio um, yeah, activist. And this is all about uh, thinking and rethinking the concept of bio art and identity with new tools that show you uh, what kind of DNA you have just by using your portrait. So, but again, uh, the sentence is um, that you are your DNA. And um, of course, this is, not, uh, this is not true. And if we look at what science is um, yeah, articulating, this is just one slide from a <clears throat> magazine called Cell. There is much more than just the genome or the microbiome. Um, or sequencing your uh, DNA. There's, uh, there are many, many other layers of uh, what uh, makes uh, individuality in our age. Why artists love to work with DNA, love to work on the biome, and not uh, on the exposome, for example. Uh, actually, I have no answer for that, but maybe in future times there will be research done on that. Of course, we have other artists, artists that um, uh, tried uh, to work with transgenics like Eduardo Katz, you all know his work, I guess, and showing um, organisms, model organisms from the sciences in the art world. Mm, and of course, we also have, you know, like not only a Joe Day, um, Eduardo Katz, we also have European or German artists working on that, but they, of course, were not uh, um, recognized in a way like this because um, these tools were used in science worldwide, not only like in the States. Of course, we have nowadays uh, young startups that work with those technologies, or we have here from Barcelona, the Barcelona Project. Mm, and of course, as soon as there is a movement out there, there are like publications like this one from George Gessert on Greenlight, where he describes all the artistic projects working with uh, transgenic organisms. Uh, this all started in the, in the 80s, and why be this plant became so, like this plant that was produced in the mid-1980s, became so um, like an icon in, in every DIY bio uh, um, workshop. You see guys with those, with t-shirts and imprinted with this plant is because it's for the first time that we see that nature can be manipulated in a way that evolution never could. And um, this was like a moment in, in, in I can say a moment in, 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 in history where it became clear that biology is now turned into, into, into technology. And nowadays, uh, to come to an end, I will show you just a few slides of what younger artists do today. Because what, what I just showed you, you know, like with, um, with, the, with Joe Davis or with Eduardo Katz or Rainer Maria Matusik, those artists were still out there to be critical, to engage in the lab, to engage in the science, uh, in the science world. But what we see nowadays is young artists who work in the field of DIY bio, or you call, call, can call it citizen science, to show that through uh, mass consumption, through uh, um, uh, pollution, through plastic pollution, for example, we turned the whole planet in a kind of laboratory. And most of our organisms uh, will be affected by those toxic molecules, for example. And how, what can we do with that? And this is a good example, like Mary Magic, uh, the project Open Estrogen, because I just want to say at the, at the end of my talk why I think there is such a big change in this field now. Because now younger artists see we have to, we have to educate people. Science has to go into our societies. We have to empower people to understand what uh, the industrialized countries and what mass consumerism did to our planet and how it will change our organism. It's not so much about the idea of changing um, 
producing new transgenic organism in a kind of creational act or godlike or second godlike uh, act. It's more about look at the facts, look what we did, and what kind of effects does this has um, um, on our on our bodies. And so this is more like um, art getting closer to science, to uh, DIY bio, and uh, yeah, but in a very interesting way, she makes like a mere magic, is producing like very funny videos. You can see the, the, those videos on her website. And uh, to show people how to hack, you know, like some kitchen equipment to produce um, a kind of, um, I wouldn't say counter, yeah, counter um, activist strategies to be aware of what is going on. So, and uh, yeah, another um, example is uh, Howard Boland, who's working with synthetic biology on Plastic Republic. It's all about uh, using uh, a low, low tech uh, um, for uh, projects to work on plastics uh, in, the, in the wild. And what is interesting is that these artists that are highly also educated in the field of science, that they are invited by institutions um, to present um, their perspective. And uh, he works a lot with uh, DNA synthesis. With, and, and like the picture I saw, uh, showed you before, it was very complicated, very expensive. Now it's very cheap. It's not it's not as cheap as sequencing, but compared to the costs in former days, it's really cheap. And, um, yeah, so, yeah, I wanted to show you a picture of uh, Craig Vendor, but this is not working, so, I, oh, here we, ha we go, and just to come to an end, science changed a lot, art also changed a lot, but science changed a lot the last 20, 30 years, especially in the field of biotech. Uh, most of the scientists, uh, scientists I know in the field of biotech tried, some failed, but most of them started also companies and startups. Craig Venter was very successful in that. And what are the driving forces of science today? And this is technology. It's not so much like the experiment. The experiment still is very important, but it's more or less like technology driven. And uh, just to quote Frank Rösel from the um, German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, we are living in a century of the genomics, the genomic discourse. And things changed a lot. So scientists are not the homo academicus, as we saw on slides by Guna from 17th, 18th century. These are the homo economicus. Um, many biologists today are wild capitalists biotechnology companies work with any biological tool and protocol, research is globalized. And we have seen an extremely increase of the biotech companies. Yeah, and what is, what could be, I wouldn't say a solution, but what can we do or what is a kind of, uh, um, yeah, idea we could develop for art or art schools is of course training students in science and also in the arts with a critical perspective. And we try this with a kind of hands-on um, approach um, in, uh, at our art school in Vienna. And this is not so much about uh, being more and more familiar with our scientific protocols. It's more about community building. It's about bringing people together. It's about having a quick or developing a critical perspective of what is going on in the sciences, but also, of course, uh, in the art world. And yeah, and this is Mary Magic in the middle. Uh, and um, well, she's, uh, and all the other students, they're wonderful to have. And I think th I'm very, very positive about um, the future because this generation is very open to be educated or to to have a community to educate uh, um, themselves and to share their knowledge but also uh, they're willing and able to to um, get information knowledge education from the art side and also from the science side and uh, yeah and for us uh, our perspective is like hands-on 
which is a little bit outdated. I showed you the machines, the use in the science world. Um, so, but it, it doesn't matter to us. Maybe it's a little bit outdated what we use, but um, the idea is to bring art and science uh, in, a, in a closer liaison. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have time for, uh, for the, a little bit of uh, discussion. We have like mm, 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm sure m m many of you will have some questions, but uh, maybe I will uh, start with just a very simple one, but also very, uh, you already said something about that. I mean, we all, it's, it's, it's a question that is there, I mean, and we all have to deal with that. But in the context of a, of a, a BNL, BNL, with a City Science BNL, which uh, that means that there's people from different, uh, worlds and different areas, and um, some of them might not be aware about those, this type of, of world that we are, we are talking. Maybe we should, we should mm, clarify, at least try to synthesize something that you already, it's implicit in your talks, uh, uh, but uh, which, which do you think are the contribution of these art science projects to society? Which do you think well, the, the key, the key aspects of of, of these uh, type of projects? What's what's happening in there that it's valuable to society and, and makes makes them makes it uh, um, so interesting for for uh, for the city and the, and the, and the society. Uh, what I think is is very uh, important is that um, most artists I know that. Um, um, somehow uh, work with scientists or work with scientific tools or work with tools that were invented in science that they have a very different outreach than the scientists and that um, of course everything I showed with biotech you also could talk to someone from the uh, from bioethics for example but artists very often are like like uh, Marta are extremely well trained and they have a non-normative perspective on that. So they can com communicate or show what they do to the world, and it's not limited to a certain perspective. Um, I'm sure you also want to educate or show something, but what you do is you present your artwork, and art is open for interpretation, and I think this is, this is the positive thing, to not just to illustrate science or to go into science communication, but to show there's art, there are artists out there, and they cope with these uh, with these contexts in a way that is important for our society. Because technology um, research uh, is getting more and more uh, sh shaping our world. Mm. Um. I, <clears throat> I, th I think that you know this is important. The fact that we have forums, occasions when different people who would otherwise not be in the same room or in the same place are here. Uh, and I did not, I, I asked you to raise your hands, not just out of, for fun, but it's, it's really important, I think, for us to understand that the, the future requires us to imagine differently and think differently. The problems we face today and for many, many years to come are going to be complex problems, problems that don't have, that don't have discipline-specific solutions. They don't come uh, handy with, oh, this problem, there's only one solution. The solution comes from physics, and physics only. No, really. Uh, anyway, you look at the, the world's big problems, the world's big problems requires a combination of different perspectives, skill sets, knowledges, and ways of working. And so, and the unfortunate thing is that many of us are running parallel, you know. If you are a science student, you study science, you, you, you go to university and then you, you get a job, you, you articulate your work and you do things, and your community might be just that. You might not have occasions to meet with artists. And, and likewise for artists, you know, they, they might never come together in a, in a way where their ideas are being challenged. Uh, so, and I think that 
we need to imagine differently. The future is, uh, is more uncertain for those who actually are only going to look at that future in relation to their single perspectives. And I think this, the, the festival, the, the Biennale, is very important because of this, that you actually have different people together. I would encourage at the end of this, don't, after this was over, don't leave. Uh, immediately afterwards, stay around for a while and meet each other. Uh, meet someone who is not your identity. If you are a scientist, willfully go out and meet someone who's from the arts. And I, I encourage this in everywhere I, I do this. We, we, you know, Martha has been in many occasions in Ingeborg and Pau. We've been in many occasions where we, we talk to different audiences. And I can tell you that it's not very often that we see audiences where there are as many, as many scientists, in fact, more scientists than there are artists. And I think it's a very, very good thing. It's progressive. The, the other thing that I think would be, would be important also to be mindful of is that um, uh, this needs to also translate into our educational institutions. Mm. Our educational institutions are still very siloed. You know, they, you are mm. only learning things in your discipline, and sometimes it's because your discipline is so deep and, and wants you to learn only those things. So before you know it, you are not able to learn other things from other perspectives. But as I said before, unless we change our educational system, we are not going to be able to deal that ne next generation, including many of you here, would not be able to face that the problems of the future. Because the problems of the future are far more complex than any one of us in the arts or the sciences or in the technology fields can, can come up with solutions for uh, by ourselves. We need to collaborate. We need to understand that we bring different things to the collaboration, and that should be encouraged. And so I applaud, as I said earlier, I applaud the city for trying to do this because this needs to happen in every city. This needs to happen in every school. We need to actually make more of these kinds of occasions where we are connecting because we are not going to make it into the future if we don't do this. It's very, very important. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I agree with both of them. I think actually the problems are already here. They're yeah. not the problems of the future. We already right. have the problems yeah. that are not going to be solved yeah. by thinking um, um, uh, specifically through one perspective. Or, but, um, and I, I, I do agree with you that it is uh, of the, the fault of the system that we've developed, which probably comes from the industrialization period, that everything needs to be, um, you know, sectioned because we can only take so much and um, and so the sections don't touch very well or don't touch uh, and we we've we've put ourselves into a situation where there's very little um, um, exchange of knowledge or we just don't believe that we can actually understand math if 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 um, if, if we are an artist or right. uh, that we don't understand physics if we're an artist but like Monica was saying in the in the panel before you know, the matter, the matter that we're made of, that then you know, is studied by physics mostly and mathematics, but then it becomes matter, it becomes wood, it becomes plastic, it becomes everything that exists as matter, and it becomes us, and we are biology. So they're, they're there together already, uh, the, 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 they do, and we understand that physics is very important and an important source of knowledge. We understand that biology is a very important source of knowledge. We understand, I think it's pretty clear, that we understand that philosophy is a very important sort, uh, source of knowledge. And I, I would always argue that art is also a very important source of, of knowledge uh, in itself. I can't believe that it, I actually have to uh, articulate this, this statement so often. Um, so it, I think people nowadays tend to believe that science is the owner of knowledge. And it's not true. <laughs> it never was, and it never will. Uh, uh, it is a good source for fresh knowledge and, and, and challenging knowledge, and knowledge that will allow us to rethink 
a lot of the knowledge that came before from philosophy, from uh, 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 so many other fields, from uh, um, aesthetics, from so many other fields that it is a, 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 good, a good source of knowledge to challenge the, the preconceptions that we have. But with that, it will also challenge the preconceptions that the so-called exact sciences will have or have now because we're all uh, uh, um, um, subject to the idea that uh, uh, our field of knowledge is better. Um, and we love it, and it's nice, and it, it's the tools that we have to understand the world. But, um, but you know, it's the, what exists and what doesn't exist yet is a combination of all the knowledges. So. You can't just go through one route. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, n now it's time for, for opening uh, the questions to the public, to the audience. Uh, there is a microphone over there, I think. Yes. So, well, th we have um, like five, uh, ten minutes for questions. If there is someone that would like to, to, to do some re reflection or even have some questions. Couple of questions, uh, <laughs> my God. Okay, just uh, I want to know if you think that the human being is, a, or the, the, yeah, we are a formula or we don't. I think it is, but I would like you to answer if you, what you think about. And the other one is DNA. It's really the thing, and it's connected with the I Ching book. And you might know that. Probably you know that. And this is a. Uh, why you are here, and this is why I am here, because it is connection, and I would like to share this uh, later with you. I, I do not know what you mean by formula, <laughs> but uh, I, I definitely don't think that human being <laughs> is a formula. Uh, I, I, I do think that we are pretty, pretty complicated and uh, with all the, the good things and the bad things and the, and the ups and the downs. And I don't think, uh, when, I, when I think about a formula, I think predictability. I think uh, about um, elements that are fixed, elements that uh, if they are variable, then they are set to be variable. Uh, I, I don't feel strongly enough that um, that that uh, that this is that the, the the way we are and the way we are, are have been historically uh, is uh, is set uh, and is predictable um, and not just individuals and individual uh, or communities but just as a whole I, I I do think and you know if you talk to someone like uh, Stellak, he would argue that we are constantly evolving, and therefore, uh, and we're not just evolving by ourselves, but we are evolving mm -hmm. in relation to other things that are becoming increasingly part of us and uh, subtracted from us. And, and so, I, I, I do, I would like to believe. Uh, it's not about a belief. Way. It's about knowing yourself. <laughs> it's not a belief. This is the question. When you yeah. believe um, it's not a theory, it's, not, it's just believing yourself or knowing no, yourself. No, I, 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 I don't believe we are a formula, no. Yeah, you are unique. And yeah. that, that's the formula. When you discover yourself, then it's, this is evolution. But, but first you have to go in, and this is holistic. And the holistic point is on the table. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Okay. okay. Now, well, now we have time for another question. So in, uh, can you hear me? Yes. In, in my country, um, we don't have a ministry of culture. We have a, a national endowment for the arts and a national endowment for the humanities. And that's a very, I've always, that's always struck me as a very sort of arbitrary and bureaucratic distinction. Absolutely. Um, however, when you asked how many of us were from the arts and how many of us were from the sciences, I didn't raise my hand either time. And I <laughs> found myself sort of, shocked that I was sort of shaped by that, um, <laughs> that, that bizarre <laughs> distinction. Um, so that's, and that's just a, an observation. And, and then somewhere in here, there's a question. Um, 
when you were talking, I'm talking, speaking to the gentleman from Michigan, um, you, you mentioned um, inductive reasoning, and I, I have to confess that I can never remember what the difference is between inductive and deductive reasoning is, right. but I, I found myself wondering about, about that and also about intuition, and particularly um, how intuition might work for a scientist, which is the thing I know the least about. Right. And, that, and, I, and I just wonder if these categories um, might be useful to think with in terms of how artists and scientists kind of apprehend the world. Um, that's it. So I'll, I'll say something quickly, and I want to make sure that others are speaking. But mm. you know, so, so the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for Humanities, I presume you're from, from the US. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that happened very recently. Uh, last, uh, over the last two years, there has been uh, uh, the National Academies of Sciences uh, of Medicine and Engineering. They co-convened with the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for Humanities, a report. Uh, they brought together a committee of about 22 people. I was part of the committee. And we worked over two years to, under, uh, to talk about, and they are, the, the charge they gave to us is to really think about what how do we best prepare the next generation for the future? What should education look like? And one of the assumptions we made and one of the uh, arguments they wanted us to find evidence for is that integrating the arts, the humanities, and the sciences, and engineering, and medicine is going to be beneficial and important for the future. That means whether you're a scientist or you're an artist, you would learn each other's discipline in order to become more successful out there. So when I ask the question about you know, who's from the arts and who's from the sciences, uh, part of it is that those who raise their hands, I presume you are interested in the arts also at some point if you are a scientist. If you are artists, you probably have some interest in the sciences also. But we, we tend to have these confessional identities, you know, identities we confess to. And I, and I do think that sometimes that becomes so, so difficult for us to shift from. And I know from, from Pau that there are some people in the, in the audience who are interested in art and science and the combinations of those things. And I, and I remain optimistic that you know, occasions like these are important and are, are beneficial to blurring that distinction. So someday when I, when I, when I am in a, in a, let's say five years from now, or 10 years from now, when I'm in, a, in, a, in an audience like this, I would, I would love to hear that uh, no one raises their hands, right? Or see that no one raises their hands because they all think that they are interested in the arts and the sciences and everything else, uh, which would be a great result. You want to, to add something? Um. He, had, he had a second thing about... Um, or maybe I can refer to that as well. Yeah, please. Because uh, um, and in Vienna, we started in 2017, just two years ago, a bachelor's study pr program called Cross-Disciplinary Strategies. Although it's an art school, it is like science class, robotics, artificial intelligence, genetics, and so on, and art and humanities. So we offer to now three, genera three generations, three classes, uh, to start from scratch with, I can't say everything, but with art, science, humanities, human rights, philosophy, and uh, the students love it, but we get a lot of cr uh, critical um, letters and emails <laughs> uh, because they say, well, first of all, people should go and learn a profound uh, understanding in one discipline. But very often, I wouldn't say then it's too late, and I think this is also why I like your report so much, uh, uh, um, knowledge from the same tree, um, which is excellent. Um, but our system, our educational system, is based on disciplines because this is such a productive and successful way of producing knowledge, but probably not, and this is what you just said, for the complex problems, uh, global challenges we face in the future. So, and I think a good argument why to 
bring the art world or artistic strategies or artists into the um, you know, academic education or say science education or the education in the humanities is to train people from day one to collaborate, to um, yeah, be able uh, to understand different languages uh, different ways of uh, of uh, looking to, at the world, but um, yeah, but this is just the beginning. But on the other hand, it's true. Uh, you also need experts. You also need people who are really trained yeah. in their field. Yeah. But then you have to train them on top mm -hmm. to work again in cross disciplinary groups. Mm -hmm. So so should we start with with the, at, at the bachelor level? Or should we integrate the arts, for example, on a PhD level? So, mm -hmm. but this is more like, this is not a general assumption. This is more like how to um, rebuild or reconstruct our uh, educational systems. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a, a maybe a little bit more radical. I'm not sure if it's radical the right way. I think, I think it's, it's, we're, we're, you know, university. University, you're already too old. Um, um, no, you're already pre-made. You, you, my kids had to decide if they wanted to go to science or, or the arts when they're, when they're 14, 15. Uh, and, and, and after that, it's gone. Uh, right. uh, and and I'm, you know, I know that they're privileged. And this is the other thing that we haven't spoken here. You know, we're, sp we're talking about education at a very high level. Um, and uh, we're talking about privileged people and, and incredibly smart people who can you know, think about you know, studying science and being interested in the arts at the same time. And, and things like this. This is not... You know, this is not the regular mundane person that is out there. Um, um, and in terms of, of, of rethinking the educational system, I think I, I do believe that the only hope that we have is to rethink it. It's to actually rethink it. And I would go, it's not about integrating the arts with the scientists or anything like that. I think people need to differentiate. It's philosophy. We don't learn philosophy early enough. Okay, the basic idea that there are facts and that there are opinions and that opinions are not facts is something that mo most people don't understand. Okay, and, and, and I think this is, the, this, is, this, is, this is one of the general problems. Actually, this is the most generalized problem that I see nowadays is that people will argue opinions as if they are facts and they will argue beliefs as if they are facts and in and, 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 and this way, there's no way of, of achieving any kind of consensus because it's different worlds. It's, it's just not compatible. You can't argue against a belief. You can't argue against an opinion. You're entitled to your opinion, but you cannot argue facts, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the great, great question <laughs> and great... Uh, final. Well, no, it's ni it's time. It's to, it's uh, we we supposed to close uh, right now. Uh, uh, if there's not a very urgent question that might n want an answer, we we, we should we should uh, leave it here. I think it's a great moment. <laughs> 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 and many thanks, many thanks, all of you for Thank being you. here. Thanks for for being uh, for your nice your great talk, and for all of you to, for, for being able to, to, to get here at this time. Uh, now it's time uh, for the Night of Academia, so you will be able to, to see uh, those different academies that are kind of hidden from, from, from the city, but they are there and they will be open to, to all the citizens. So please, uh, if you're able to go, uh, now is your time. Ay sols dirbus que ya bueno la bienal continúa y muchas gracias por seguir muchas gracias a todos y seguiremos seguiremos hablando muy bien